This is Comic Shenanigans, episode 1044, a conversation with Kelly Thompson. Welcome to the Comic Shenanigans Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Chapman. This is episode 1044. It's yet another conversation with Kelly Thompson. Uh, Kelly Thompson is, of course, an acclaimed creator uh, who has just recently received uh, f- f- was it five nominations uh, or Eisner nominations this year, uh, which is a huge deal for very different uh you know, different works, which is extra exciting. Um, so this was a really fun conversation to be able to check back in with Kelly, uh, given everything that's kind of going on and all these nominations. Um, you know, obviously she's doing kind of the press tour and kind of promoting uh, Scarlet, which actually just came out this past week, which is kind of why we're dropping this episode now. We recorded this, I think, a day or two before um, Scarlet actually came out. Um, it was, it's always fun to talk to Kelly. This is actually her fifth appearance on Comic Shenanigans. So you can check out her first appearance back in August 2018 in episode 602, second appearance in episode 716 from October 2019. Uh, then apparently it was almost three years, uh, before she came back, which was on, uh, Wednesday, April 22nd, sorry, April, Wednesday, April 20th, 2022 in episode 968. And then, uh, her most recent one was just a few months ago, or it feels like a few months ago, but it's, you know, it's actually getting out to almost a year ago, uh, on Saturday and sorry, in, uh, September 2023 in episode 1006. Um, so in this episode, we talk about our current work, working on Bridge of Prey, uh, working on It's Jeff, which is, you know, continues to be enormously charming. We talk about Black Cloak. We talk a little bit about the call and we also talk about Birds of, I already said Birds of Prey. I would talk about Scarlet. Uh, not as much Scarlet as maybe I should have, but I also feel like there's a lot of great interviews she's doing right now, which focus more on Scarlet because that's kind of the, the bigger push right now. So, um, not to tell you that you shouldn't listen to my show, but once you're done with my show, you can check out other, uh, recent appearances she's done, um, and uh, it's just, it's always a pleasure to talk to Kelly and it's great to see her have so much success and to have her get the Eisner nominations. Uh, I kind of mentioned in this episode, but when we had her back on, when we had her back on the show during episode 1006, it was kind of interesting because she was talking about, you know, pretty frankly, and I've always appreciated her candor about, you know, what it's like to be in the industry and try to make a go of, you know, create her own and what that's like and the stress of it. And, you know, you might get a claim, but it doesn't always you know, necessarily equate to dollar figures. But uh, being able to now get, you know, more Eisner nominations and, and on so many different types of work and not just kind of all in one milieu um, and what that really means to her as a creator and uh, to get that kind of recognition. So this was a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, interview with her and I would really relish the opportunity to kind of delve into it with her and really kind of, you know, also kind of follow up on how she was feeling before and, and how, uh, you know, she continues to feel about her work, etc. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did, uh, you know, sitting down with Kelly to talk about it. You can email me at comic shenanigans at gmail.com, rate the show on iTunes, sorry, Apple Podcasts, listen to us on Apple Podcasts and also listen to us on Spotify. Thanks so much for listening and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Kelly, welcome back to the Comic Shenanigans Podcast. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. This is uh, actually marks your fifth appearance. You're part of the, the Five Timers Club. Yeah, it's just like being on SNL, right? So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I know the big news, obviously, is the fact that you dominated the Eisners in terms of the nominations this year, which is really exciting for everybody. Um, are, you, are you talked out when it comes to the Eisners yet? No, you know, we haven't talked to, I haven't talked about it too much. I feel like most of people I've been talking to about Scarlet and Powerpuff Girls and maybe to a lesser degree, Birds of Prey. Um, but we haven't talked about the nominations too much. I, I think in part because, you know, what do you, what do you say? Well, I, I'm just so honored, especially with Black Cloak 
getting up there and the call, you know, to do some creator own. Like those are really my first creator own. So to see them be recognized like that is uh, pretty incredible. I did do a previous Heart in a Box with Meredith with Dark Horse. That was really my one of my first credits. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I haven't really done any creator owned. Um, I did Mega Princess, but that's sort of a co. I mean, it mm-hmm. is a creator. It's like a co-own, right, with Boom. Okay. Um, but so I haven't done a lot of that. So that was really rewarding to, like, have some of the work for hire work being recognized at the same time as the as the creator-owned work was really great. I will say that I think maybe one of the reasons people don't talk about this stuff more is because you're, like, very excited to be nominated and everything, and then you go look at who you're nominated with, and you're like, oh, well, I'm going to get destroyed. These books are great, you know. So <laughs> it's a it's a really nice way, though. It's really, regardless of what happens, I know it sounds trite the way people are like, "Oh, I just it's an honor to be nominated," but it really is. It feels a little, it feels some kind of way to have your work up there next to other work that you really respect and admire, and other creators that you respect and admire. So it's a, it's great. It's great to have that. And as you said, it obviously it hits different when it's creator owned stuff because, you know, other stuff might always kind of be on the periphery of being up there because it's a character that people love, et cetera. Like, yeah. it is something different when it's like, well, I birthed this into existence. This doesn't exist without me at all. Yeah. How, yeah, how much of this is, you know, people just love this IP and how much of this is people love this thing we're making? Yeah, it's hard. So you bring up an interesting thing. I don't think I've ever asked anyone this. When you, Look at your nominations. And as you said, when you look at the people you're up against, which category were you most like, oh, man, <laughs> like that's who I'm up against? I mean, honestly, I felt, I felt that way about all of them. Um, <laughs> but maybe the worst one in some ways is the humor publication, mm. because I don't know if the I don't know if that's how. Marvel submitted us or how the Eisner slotted us. I did submit Jeff. Um but I can't remember if I – I probably picked, like, digital or a print of digital category or something, and we showed up in the best humor publication. And while I don't disagree, <laughs> we're a humor <laughs> publication, and I find us hilarious and adorable, I that feels hard. That feels like a tough category, man, to be – the. I mean, we don't even have any dialogue. <laughs> Like, <laughs> that's a tough category to be a uh, humor publication. But I also love that, you know, a silent comic being a contender there is pretty fucking cool, you know? So. Oh, yeah. It, it blows me away every time I read Jeff because it's so fun. It's so pure. Um, I'm always uh, really taken with your skill because it's really difficult to write First of all, like a humor book at all, to not have dialogue, to then trust your artist or team of artists, because you have Guru Hero, but I think in season three you had a different artist as well, correct? Yeah, season three is split. I can't remember if it's half and half. I think it might be five and seven is the split. Mm-hmm. Uh, now Fuji did uh, five of four or five or six of the episodes, episodes uh, issues. I can't decide what to call them. <laughs> uh, episodes, I guess. I don't know. Um, for that season. And listen, they're about as great. If you can't have Guru Hero, now Fuji is an incredible, uh, <laughs> creator to have. Uh, they do cute stuff so well. Um, and so they really were dialed in to Jeff, like right away from the beginning. Um, you know, they did, <laughs> they did one of my favorite shots of Jeff from the whole season. So, you know, it was really, it was cool to have them on board and we were very grateful. I mean, you can't leave me hanging like that. You got to tell me which shot you're talking about. Oh, it's from the one where he gets in Kate's suitcase unbeknownst to her. And Mm -hmm. like, there's something about when she's like picking him up and the way he's turned. I mean, he just looks so cute. Like it's like a very palpable feeling of like, man, I I really want one of those. (laughs) (laughs) So are, are there not any official plushies of uh, of Jeff yet? Like, I feel like that's just a merchandise waiting to happen. Yeah, it feels like a mistake, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> I don't know what Marvel's doing, honestly. I think it's, I think they're just leaving lots and lots of money on the table. I think Jeff should already be a Funko. I think he should be a plush. I think he should be a statue. 
I think that statue would sell out in pre-orders immediately. I mean, especially if they design something great. Like, he's so fun. He's so fun. Artists love – there's so much fan art of him. Artists love drawing him. I mean, let's go back. Let's 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 say it's great that, that Daniele and I designed him and created him and put him in West Coast Avengers, and I wanted him to live forever, and so then I moved him to Deadpool – <laughs> and, you know, we're now we're keeping him alive in a Marvel Unlimited. But a huge part of that is Guri Hiru, who had never worked on the character, to my knowledge, directly, like uh, like they were paid and asked to do something for Jeff. But they started just drawing him into stuff because they were into it, you know. And that sort of organic love of a character uh, is hugely responsible for for launching him. I think you know they did a um, a really fantastic uh, illustration for it was an expo. For some reason, I want to say it was like a Tokyo Expo, but I could be wrong. But it had like Ms. Marvel, Gwenpool, Squirrel Girl, um, you know, a handful of female heroes. Maybe Wasp was in it. And then they had – and they were like on the street like getting food from a cart or whatever. And they drew Jeff on a leash like in like a little jacket. <laughs> and it was – people were freaking out over it. And then they were drawing him into things as, like, little Easter eggs. Like, they did a great little short series called Heroes at Home with Zeb Wells. And okay. Jeff would show up on, like, a coffee cup. And then he'd be on Spider-Man's boxers he was folding. And he was on a magnet. And he was – so he was just everywhere. And it was like they made him feel so – layered into the Marvel universe that I think they really helped launch him into his own little series. And they certainly um, are the, the look that he has now that he's evolved into is certainly thanks to them. Although I will say that I think Kevin Labronda was actually in our Deadpool issue where they went to Krakoa. I think he's the first one who drew him as that more round boy Jeff shape that mm. Guri, Guri Hero has kind of perfected now. Uh, so it's been a really fun little evolution for this guy. He's in video games. I mean, by far the most popular thing I've ever done. Jeff's a land shark. Who knew? <laughs> you never know what's going to hit, right? <laughs> you really don't. <laughs> um, so, uh, so again, the question always becomes for me, like, when you're developing these stories, like, does it get harder or easier now that you've done three seasons worth of these stories? Because, you know, it's such a different muscle than any other yeah. of the muscles you would use as a comic writer. The most it can is at least to those, you know, people who do 10 pagers, like people who are used to 10 page stories, like shorter, um, real estate. It's probably most akin with that, but even then it's so different because you're essentially just writing gags, but yeah. you can't use dialogue or very sparingly using like, um, you know, um, I guess textile clues. So I'm curious if it does get easier, if it gets harder, or if it's more of a thing where you get into the groove for the season, then you're done, and then when you come back, you're like, "How do I do this again?" I I think it's harder, but I've been doing a thing that helps. It gets harder as I go because the real genius of it is everything Guri Hero is doing, and then what I'm bringing to the table is the idea. Like, right. I mean, I mean, I'm writing them a whole script and they're really incredible artists who can draw literally anything and not only draw everything, but make everything cute and fun. So it's very fun to write for them. And they really get it. Like, I feel like even though we speak completely different languages, we're very in sync about how we see Jeff and the kind of way we want him portrayed. So, like, we don't even have to talk about it. It's just unspoken. But I think that what I'm bringing to the table really is the conceit. That's my biggest offering. I mean, I do write the script, but you're right. It, it has to, how I turn it and twist it and how they're able to execute it relies so heavily on other things because you can't use dialogue to do that. So when I, so my trick is that I try to just have a, I just have a document open all year where I just write down little ideas I have, things that I see in the world or things I see my cats do. That's one that happens a lot. <laughs> uh, just think, things I see in a cartoon or whatever that give me ideas for other conceits that I might, you know, what does Jeff look like doing this? What would it be like if Jeff went here? You know, that kind of stuff. So I just note that stuff sort of throughout the year. And then when we're getting close to needing to start some of these scripts, I just sort of look at the list and based on that, 
you know, see what ideas have interest me the most, what seem to like fit together, but not feel repetitive of each other, you know, that kind of thing. But it is hard because, you know, it, it doesn't have any dialogue. And so your gags either have to get a little bit more complex, which means getting longer, which is not something you really should do because everyone has to get paid the same amount of money. So we should be keeping it the same. Mm-hmm. And so you're trying to play within these bounds. And it does get tricky because the more complicated the conceit, the more panels you need and the more page space you need. And it, it runs out fast. So what I tend to look at more than shorts, though, because I'm sorry to say that while there are many, many brilliant shorts that do a lot in eight or ten pages, a lot of the time what they're doing is a lot of writing. So that's not very helpful for me. <laughs> I, lo- I look more at cartoons. I watch a lot of cartoons. If I need to get in a Jeff headspace, I watch a bunch of cartoons. Anything. Tom and Jerry. I mean, the, my, fav- my new favorite has emerged uh, is for Looney Tunes, the um, Sam and Ralph with the oh, show. Yeah. The she- uh, those sheep. I, I, like, I'm going to say something very blasphemous to the Coyote and Roadrunner uh, <laughs> cartoons that I've always been. They've always been some of my favorites, and they still are. But let me tell you what: I prefer those ridiculous, dumb-looking, hilarious sheep to Roadrunner. Like, they're so dumb. I watched one the other day where. <laughs> Where, where he's like feeling the fur for like doneness, like to see which one he wants to take. And then she was just there, just chewing her little food. It's, I, I don't know, I find them endlessly charming. So, yeah, uh, cartoons are incredibly helpful because they almost never have dialogue. And, uh, it really is an incredible reminder. How do I do this? How do I translate, you know, not these same ideas, but ideas like this? How do I translate that into these static images? Mm-hmm. But like I said, it helps knowing you have partners who can draw literally anything. <laughs> like, hey, take this monstrous thing and make it cute. They will do it. They, they Like, they can do anything. I'm so impressed by them every time. So one of my favorites of season three was um, a gag strip with you have Jeff seeing um, – Oh my god, now I'm forgetting. Like, um, hot air balloons going by, by his window. Oh and he yeah. He's one of Spider-Man and Ace's Modoc, which is yeah. great because he's hanging out with Gwenpool. Obviously, she had a relationship with Modoc in her own book. Um, and then he goes out to attack it, which is so funny. But I think my favorite part is the button, um, where you see the giant Jeff balloon with the, you know, the deflated, uh, Modoc balloon in his mouth. Cause I didn't even realize or clock at first yeah. that there yeah. always was that balloon before. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah. it's really well put together. So I'm curious yeah. how you lay out something like that and how do you even communicate to Guru Hiru? Actually, it wasn't Guru Hiru. It was yeah. The other yeah, I was going to say right. that one's now Fuji. I think that was the first one they did. Um, well, it might have been the second. I think they did the snowman one first. Mm. Um, but so I don't think I – I can't remember if that's actually in the script or not. But but now does that – and Guru Hiru does too where they just – they're this is part of what makes them great is not only can they take your script and transform it into this incredible thing, but they're just very smart and they're big fans. Like the same way that you get all those – Jeff's drawn in as Easter eggs into something that nobody told them to do. Like they do that all the time because they're just fans of things. And they're like, Oh, I want to draw, you know, this adorable octopus I saw on this other thing, you know, or whatever. And so like it just comes through in their work. And I think now is the same. So, uh, really just a, just a love of what they're doing and you can just feel it in those pages. Um, I don't remember if I specifically asked, the, the, that the Modoc should be in to Jeff's mouth. But <laughs> I know I didn't ask for and got, and it was truly my favorite bit about it, is how the all the people holding the balloons were, like, color-coded to, like, and, like, to fit. Like, here are the Spider-Man holders, and here are the Modoc holders. And I think one of them were in, like, an AIM hazmat suit. Like, so they were all coordinated. Like, it was just so smart and so funny <laughs> and cool. I loved it. Um. But the other thing I want to say is not that not that Jeff wouldn't have an issue with Modoc because of the Gwenpool of it all, but Modoc created him, so that's he's true. Got a lot of beef with Modoc. I mean, not that he doesn't want to be created, but I think he has some complaints for the complaint department. So <laughs> how that might have gone down. <laughs> Another great one that uh, I really enjoyed with my son was uh, with um, uh, Jeff eating all of Hulk's food through portals. Yeah. Um, which again felt like such great visual gags. And again, I'm curious 
like how much description are you giving, um, you know, the artist here? Because there's so much detail. But again, how much of it is in the script? I think a lot of it's in the script because I don't know. I don't ever want to not do my part of the job. Like, I think there's a real art as a writer to figuring out not just in general, but specific to an artist you're working with, what's the right amount of script, even in a silent, because some, some don't want to be hemmed in and others feel like if you're not giving them anything that they're doing all the work. So every artist is different. Every collaboration with a writer is different. So you guys sort of have to feel that out yourselves in the case of Gurihiru, and I would say to a lesser degree now, not because they're lesser, but just because we haven't worked together as much, I would say with Grey Hiru, it's, it's very natural. <sighs> I just can envision what they're going to do mm-hmm. at this point. Like, we're so in sync on how Jeff goes and how he looks and how he feels and the kind of adventures of how we want him portrayed. I feel like I pretty well know. I mean, they do always surprise me a little bit because they're just that good, but I do feel like I can really see it in my head when I'm writing it. And particularly because it's that scrolling format and because clarity becomes even more important because there's no words, I do go write what I think I'll get. Whereas I feel like when I do more, you know, a recent Birds of Prey issue, even though I've worked with Javi, Javier Pina a lot, and I feel like I know his style and what he's interested in and what he does, I'll still be pretty surprised, but I'll be like, oh, I didn't know he was going to do that. That's interesting. Okay. And, like, it's always interesting or usually interesting, and it's almost never a problem, and it's usually a delight. But there is some real comfort in, like, oh, I know what this is going to look like. I know what they're going to do, and I'm so excited about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So a a question about, well, first of all, with this Portals one, this one definitely felt like it had a a Looney Tunes kind of feel to it. Because that's kind of slapstick, you know, kind of fun and silliness. Uh, One that also felt like it it really scratched that itch was the one where we have Jeff in Iron Man armor, which is, first of all, (laughs) great image. Um, But honestly, I have to say, I was almost surprised by the end tag I almost I didn't expect him to then get back into, you know, his cage, so to speak, and be like, well, I didn't do anything. I'm I'm just stuck here. Like, I love that that beat. But I do not. Yeah. I actually did not see it coming. Oh, that's great. Well, I mean, that's great when we can get that. I mean, um, uh, another one of my uh, another great example of that, like button is that the one I think it was the first strip of last year. It was done by Gurry Hero and it was like. Kate coming to Jeff and like suggesting a trip and showing him a brochure and then he's imagining himself on the trip or whatever and then at the end Kate gets rolled out in like the pet container like rolled out yes. to him to go with him. Oh my him. god that was so funny. And I wrote at the end I was like if it's funny maybe there's a little after beat where he's like measuring her to see if she'll fit in the crate <laughs> and when I got it back, I was like, I didn't know if they were going to do it or not. And I laughed this out loud bark of a laugh because it was my favorite little bit. And of course they did it and they nailed it. And it was the favorite bit. So I don't know. They just, they could just transform everything into something so fun. That I'm glad you brought up that bit though. Cause it was so funny. <laughs> right. I mean, cause it's like, it's, I love a double joke, a joke buried in a joke. You know, there's a, <laughs> there's this show there's a show called uh, the two of us uh it's on max now i think it started on comedy central and it's just a it's just a sitcom it's a half hour comedy thing and i find it very funny my partner as well and there's a joke from one season that i just could never stop thinking about where she and her brother they're both sort of like they want to be in insider circle, red carpet stuff, but they're sort of outside of that, you know? They're like hangers on a little bit. And so they're trying to get in this red carpet event. And this woman is the woman at the table who won't let them in is like arguing with them. And then at the end, she looks at the brother and she goes, you can go, Mrs. DeGeneres. And it's just like a, like a whole separate joke that this woman thought the whole time she was arguing with them that the, that the brother was Ellen DeGeneres just because he's like <laughs> dressed a certain way or something. And it, it's just like it was a whole funny joke, but then that bit was really the joke. Like that was actually the real bit. So I love something that can like 
unload in levels like that. And it's hard to do with Jeff because we don't have like the complexity of it, but you can get away with it sometimes because Guri Hero are so capable that they can just, they can just do it. Absolutely. Now you mentioned Birds of Prey for a moment. Obviously I'm going to come back to it because I want to talk about Birds of Prey. But one thing I, I loved about, I think it was issue eight, when you have the moment when uh, Big Barda has no clothes on when she jumps into the fray, and yeah. the, but there's just that the classic shot of uh, Big Barda's, I guess, head over her yeah. body. Was that yeah. deliberately inspired from David Aja's take on Hawkeye? Or would oh, come- yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, the playing with the cheesecake of it all and the beefcake of it all was not, that was more just a nod to comics in general and sort of mm-hmm. the fact that I think that stuff belongs here, but this is how to do it right, in my opinion. Like, you got to have an artist who is not, you know, I never would have tried that issue with artists I don't know as well as Javi and David Lopez, because I know I'm not going to have to talk them out of a lot of really weird, objectifying male gaze stuff. And I also know that if I tell them to draw a bunch of beefcake so that there's equal opportunity for everyone, that they get it, you know? And so... It it allows me to play with that a little bit. But again, that all comes back to trusting your artists. Like I think at that if if you want to do anything that's sort of outside the box, you really have to know that you have the right partner. It was uh it was it was always a fun gag to see it whenever it's used, but again it yeah. felt very appropriate to the moment and very appropriate to the character. Like Big Barda doesn't care. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's that's my thing, is Barda doesn't assimilate. Barda will fight everyone naked. She doesn't give a shit. Like that's and I love that about her. I think it's rare and unique and to be celebrated and I love her. She's also a huge pain in the ass. But that that fits. Uh but yeah, the the head was the classic head was definitely an homage. I hope it wasn't a ripoff uh, and it was more of an homage, but uh, I we didn't try to hide what we were doing. And I think that's certainly the most famous by many, many miles example of it. So I feel like it's too fun to be taken too seriously because it's right? just such a, a fun moment. I will say as a total aside, I'm literally wearing a purple shirt today that does have the Hawkeye face really low <laughs> on the shirt. Um, <laughs> deliberately for that reason. I, I didn't, I hadn't made that connection when I was, Prepping for our interview, I was rereading that issue of Birds of Prey. I'm like, oh, yeah, I should ask about that. Oh, yeah, I'm wearing this shirt. So The funny thing is we did try it with another, like a Barda head that Javi had drawn. Okay. Um, that Jess was, she was like, oh, I had Art pull this. She's like, what do you think? She's like, because, oh, we have to censor this. But I was like, well, I knew we would. I think I even put it in the script. Like, we're probably going to have to censor this. But, um <laughs> And I think I put, let's do a cartoon Hawkeye head, and so, but not Hawkeye, obviously. Um, <laughs> although, boy, that would have been funny, right? If I could have gotten the rights to use the Hawkeye head, fuck, I should have used, I should have used Green Arrow. Oh man! Well, that would have been funny. Damn it! Damn it! Such a meta. Me- maybe a meta that, maybe commentary. we can change it for the trade. That would be funny. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the appropriate people about this idea. Uh, anyway, so. I I knew that was going to happen, so she had pulled, and it looked great. I was like, well, that's great. I was like, I was going to suggest this, and I sent her the Kirby, and she's like, oh, my God, that's so much better. I was like, well, I mean, I didn't want to say, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's what we're doing over there. So Birds of Prey has been such a fun romp since the beginning. I, I hope, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you have an Eisner for it, an Eisner nomination for it, but how has the feedback been since you've really gotten the, you know, your feet running on it? Because I think when we talked in September, it was still only, I think, maybe an issue or two in. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's been great. I, it was hard. It's been hard to lose Leo. I think, um, we're trying to make the best of it. Um, and certainly, excuse me, the hiccups. Uh, certainly having Leo or having uh, Javi and David Lopez on seven and eight was amazing. Like I, you know, I have no complaints. That's incredible. But and that was always sort of the story that was intended to be. But when it came time to do this Worlds Without End arc, I really, I sort of designed that specifically for Leo. And I didn't know, I didn't think we had time to get anyone else that is good enough at Leo's level to be able to handle what I was asking for in that arc, which were all sorts of style changes. Mm -hmm. And so the other way for us to go, especially because after losing Leo and Ben, we were really up against it timing wise, which is 
a lot of problems, but mostly a problem with casting because it limits who you can go out to, is that if we took a huge risk, high risk, high reward, <laughs> if, we took, <laughs> if we took a huge risk and brought in five, actually six different artists to handle the five issues, one of them on flashbacks and then the rest of them handling like this changing portal environment that we could let them lean in to what they'd want to do. And we knew there would be some rough spots because that's what happens when you don't have a consistent art team. But Jess and I have kept our hands really, really tightly around it. And for the most part, it's coming together really well. I mean, we're getting the second part of this story tomorrow, which is Robbie Rodriguez introduces an exciting new character designed by Robbie Rodriguez, which is never a bad thing. And we had Jonathan Case last issue, and then Gavin Goodry is doing these scenes that take place basically in the real, real world outside the portal to, like, give us sort of an anchoring beat. Mm-hmm. And in that respect, I think it's really working. I think it's there's really cool stuff happening. I think it leans into, like, yes, there are some flaws and some roughness to the edges, but it also leans into something that comics can do so well, you know, by reimagining these worlds every time and letting artists go wild and do their thing. It's just been really fun, you know. It's scary too. I'm not going to pretend it's not scary. It's hard. It's hard to you got to you both have to dial up the control and also just accept that some things are not going to turn out exactly how you want, you know. For sure. Well, I guess you don't you don't really have a chance to learn rhythms as well when you do something like that. So you have to kind of have, it's more of an onus on you as well to be more airtight in your plotting and your scripting um, yes. so that there's less, you know, less yes. room for interpretation, which in some ways is negative because you want your artist to feel the ability to be able to go wide and be able to try things, but also you need it to establish certain things because there's other artists doing other chapters. Yes, yes, exactly. All of that is exactly right. And I think like in our example for tomorrow, I think you'll see like Robbie did an incredible job. But like, I think, you know, Robbie, I wouldn't have taken Jonathan off part one. He did an incredible job. But like part one also would have been maybe more suited to the what Robbie wants to draw. But Mm -hmm. Robbie ended up on part two for a variety of reasons, including scheduling stuff. And so he does a great he does an incredible job with it it's just the whole purpose is it, of it is to lean into either what someone's best at or what they seem to want to do right so like part of the way i was get able to get my friend sophie campbell a brilliant brilliant artist to come and do an issue is to go hey but it's going to look like this are you interested now and she's like oh okay Like, I get to do that at DC with a Birds of Prey book? Okay, now you have my interest, right? And so, like, that's sort of, I think, how you, ideally, you want to pair things up with an artist and a, and a, and a world conceit that, that will fit for them. Unfortunately for Robbie, it was already plotted and I couldn't really twist it to better fit him, but he did an incredible job with what he got and, uh, I'm really happy with how it's going. Um, and I think there's some really fun, uh, fun things coming in. I mean, the Sophie issue for sure is very, is a very high bar for me. I'm very excited about that. But also, Javi drawing dinosaurs and birds of prey is, I mean, shoot it directly into my veins, please. So that's next month. <laughs> <laughs> It does. It does feel like every issue, like you. And I, I don't mean this in a negative way at all, but it just seems like you're having a fun time. Like it's just, yeah. you know, it's it's a book that doesn't feel like it's taking itself too seriously. It has serious moments, obviously, and moments that are very serious and true and authentic to the characters. But it also just feels, in general, that it's a romp. And what I appreciate about that is that I like comics that are not afraid to have fun. And I feel like your book, I feel like Tom Taylor's uh, Nightwing feels like that. Like books that have moments of seriousness because you know you need some sort of stakes, but also also not afraid to have fun and let the characters have a bit of fun as well. And it really makes the entire reading experience much more enjoyable. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think it's like, I guess what I would say to anyone reading who's like, well, I liked it better when it was just Leo every issue. And, you know, I mean, the first thing I'd say is, I mean, uh, agreed. I wish Leo drew almost every issue of every comic ever. Everything would look so good all the time. He's a genius. Um, I would have loved he and I to still be the consistent team for a ton of reasons. But that's not possible. <laughs> so let's live in reality. And while we're living in reality, let's 
let these incredible artists let loose on a weird story that maybe you could only tell in comics because of the kind of medium it is. And, and so maybe instead of holding its feet to the fire, this arc, because is it as perfect as arc one where Leo was drawing all of it? No, it's not going to be as perfect as that. It's, it's multiple people's visions of something, not one vision, but it might be really fun. You might get to see some characters you love in some wild outfits doing some wild stuff. <laughs> like, why shouldn't we do that? It seems great. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get back to your creator own work, as I know we only have a bit, a bit, bit more time. I'm curious about what it's like for you as a creator to be able to obviously put these books out into the world. So I'm going to talk for a moment about uh, The Call. So a month or two, a month and a half ago, I guess, you have the first trade kind of comes out for the call. What is that experience like for you? Because obviously there is, a, unfortunately, a lot of people are trade waiters and they'll see the, so they'll see buzz about a book or they'll see that it got an Eisner nomination and then they'll go get the trade. So what is it like for you as a creator when those trades do come out? Um, what is that feeling for you? I mean, a lot of tension and fear, but also excitement. I mean, I think it helped for me. Um, you know, these being my first two creator owns, I have to say, I really think we stuck the landing on both of them. That's not just me bragging. I think endings are really tough. I think, I think they're especially tough in a comics narrative where you have to have five endings before you have the final ending. That's part of what mm -hmm. makes them so tough. Mm -hmm. um, I do think both the Cull and Blood Cloak read really well in trade in part because I think we stuck those landings. Um, Black Cloaks, uh, I think the Cole's ending is more of a <gasps> moment, and the B Black Cloak is more of a holy shit, we've come all this way. It's more of a, it's more of a cohesive talks back to how it started kind of a feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really proud of both of them. I think they're powerful, and um, I. Do because I feel like they read really well in trade, perhaps better than they read monthly. I hope they're going to find lots of new fans. Um, yeah. <laughs> when you when, when you wrote the end in the Black Cloak's first arc, I'm curious about that one because in a lot of ways it feels like it could just be the end of that story, like an open ended kind of ending to what could happen with those characters next, but at the same time not necessarily demanding it uh, in terms of like a cliffhanger. So I'm curious when you went into writing that issue, did you always know? that it was going to kind of lead into more or was that just always an idea that what you'd like to do or like, how did you kind of code those last few pages? Cause it felt like it could have kind of gone either way, depending on how you scripted the very ending for, for the call you said, right? No, sorry. I meant for black cloak. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, so black cloak was technically plotted when Meredith and I started okay. and I did stick fairly close to that. But we had a couple options on what the ending should be and also what the ending should be, depending on if we felt strongly that we were going to do more or not. So the ending did change a little bit in that respect. Plotting, working on Black Cloak was, you know, we ended up with like, that first trade is like 180 pages. So it's way over six issues. Um, it's mm -hmm. more like eight almost. It's like somewhere between seven and eight issues of comic. And we were really, I don't really like the word blessed, but we were really lucky, how about that, to have, you know, sort of extra money and time and space that we could make it as big as we needed to make it. And I was grateful at the time that, you know, I'm, I'm very, after getting lost in the woods on a novel once, I always plot now because that feeling is terrifying. And <laughs> even if you div, 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 <laughs> even if you divert from your plot, you still have it. It's still a roadmap that gives you sort of confidence and security, knowing that you can fall back on it. But I do think that in the intervening years between getting lost on that novel and being terrified to now, I've become such a different writer. And as I discovered on Black Cloak, if I had plotted it out better and more I don't know if precisely is the word, but let's use it. I think I would have missed a lot of opportunities. But because I played a little looser with it, 
there were a lot of things that came up that I could tell Meredith was interested in or that I knew I was interested in. And like she would design a new character and I'd be like, man, I love that character. How am I going to get more of them in here? And it did end up changing the book and definitely lengthening it, lengthening it because I, there were a lot of little corners that I wanted to sort of dig into. And that's still true now. We didn't get nearly as close as I'd like to get, but that was the ending that I wanted and hoped we would land on. And so I'm really glad that's where we ended up. A question I had when I was reading it, um, just in terms of kind of the voice you use, because you start off obviously with like, you know, kind of narration and it feels very like, you know, sci-fi speak in, in the nicest way possible, uh, you know, <laughs> just a certain level of language. And as you get through, it's interesting actually, because you see that opening shot of Kuros and you have the, the narrative boxes on the left hand side and then slowly they start to kind of drift to the right and that's when your language starts to change it becomes more conversational like yeah. you, again because you have like kind of a more broad again more sartorial speak and then you you know end up in you know the the narration is now saying you know fucking and assholes and it's using yeah. more colloquial language I'm curious yeah. what kind of decision you made to kind of glide the language that way because I thought it was very interesting because it felt like it was starting with one way and immediately mm-hmm. transfer to another, which set the tone in a different way for how these characters in this world was going to actually be portrayed, which felt very accurate to your voice. So I'm curious if that if there was that much thought involved or if I'm just conflating too much. No, no, you're right on target. I think I – so I hate exposition in novels, uh, in, in, in comics, in I, – I just – I really – like, I mean, we all have to do it sometimes, but I am trying to pare mine down as much as possible because – when I hit a wall of text in a comic, nine times out of ten, what I do is close the comic. So <laughs> I assume other people are a little more tolerant than I am at this point, but I it makes me mad. It makes me mad. It makes me mad to have that many words on the page most of the time. I The artists are working really hard, and if they're doing their jobs well, we don't need to be saying all that shit. Um, <laughs> you know, I – so my my approach – I didn't want any, I didn't want to be in anyone's head in Black Cloak, um, for a variety of reasons, including because I didn't feel it was just Phaedra's story. It was a dual piece, even though she's clearly the lead. Pax, I didn't want his voice to be pushed down like that, and I don't like using, I don't like being in multiple people's heads in a narrative, mine or anyone else's. I, it's a very big pet peeve of mine. So, so I was right out of the gate. We weren't going to be using captions other than just like locator captions, except for on that first page. And of course the very last page. And what I wanted to do was play with expectation versus how I wanted to write the book. I wanted to write the book where you can't pinpoint, you know, did it happen in, you know, olden times before the world, before the dinosaurs and it was all wiped out. Is it the future? Is it another planet? Like, you know, we don't answer any of those questions, but I wanted to feel like it could be any of those things. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to give it a sort of modern, not what you would expect for a fantasy story. But I wanted to start with the trope that we all expect. So hopefully that page starts the way you would expect any one of those pages to ever begin with sort of the info dump of what came before but before by the time you get to the bottom of that first page i hope it has completely pulled the rug out from under you and you're not sure what to expect when you turn the page that's the goal well i think you achieved it thank you (laughs) so i i think i only have six minutes left and somehow i have to wedge two two major questions in there um the first one is or just a general thing what can you tell us about the return of black cloak because as we speak it's about to come out in i think a few weeks um, so what can you tell us about the return? So it was supposed to come out in a few weeks, but we did have to move it. I'm sorry if you oh, didn't see okay. that. We moved it to August, um, which is okay. mostly mostly just a practicality thing. Um, Meredith and I have both had a few things going on that we've had to deal with, which has slowed us down. And, you know, we're not – yeah, so that's the gist of that. But um, So it will be August now for issue seven. Um, it's – the next arc is – five issues uh so it should be finished by the end of the year and i'm even though i'm very sad we had to move it i have to say black cloak very much feels more like a a fall book to me not a summer book so it sort of feels fitting in a way um the uh I'm really excited about it. I'm also, even though I hate that we've had so much time pass between issue six and seven, that there's a pretty big time skip in the jump of multiple years. So um, 
I maybe that will feel a little less jarring to people now that they've had to wait a year. <laughs> um, That's great. I'm really excited about it. I mean, we're going to pick up with those characters and that city lo- being very different from what it, how we left it. So it's exciting. Was it? Did it feel like? I mean, because you are having a time jump and we're going to be reemerged into a world that has been changed, was that daunting or is it just more exciting? Um, I, I think it's exciting. I think if I, if my schedule was a little better and I was a little less harried, it would be more exciting, but it's a little stressful right now. Okay. So the, I guess the, the next thing I have to mention before we, we end is, uh, can you tell us about Scarlet? Like, how did this even come about? I know you've been doing a lot of press for it, so I'm definitely not the first person to get here. Um, but I'm <laughs> curious, what can you kind of tell us about how you were kind of pitched this? Or were, were you kind of brought in to make a pitch for any books uh, in this universe? And then Scarlet ended up being the book that kind of came to you. I'm just curious how that happened. No, I um I I was offered it, which I hope is what happens if you write enough badass possibly redheads. Um <laughs> I I just must have been on the short list. Um and so they just offered it sort of outright and I was very excited about it. I had I'm a big fan of Scarlet from when I was a kid. Um and I was had a slot in the schedule and I'd never gotten to work with Skybound before. And, you know, I'd only been working with image for the last year or so. So it was, uh, you know, it was like all checked all the boxes of something I'd want to do. So it was really exciting. Who gave you the call? Um, I think it was, I think it was Sean. I think, I think Joshua gave me a heads up, Joshua Williamson, that, that, mm-hmm. that to be on the lookout. And then I think it was Sean that, that called me at, 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 uh, at Skybound or emailed probably because we do everything by email. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious what the discussion is like, because obviously, you know, they're creating this Energon universe and obviously Scarlet's a, a fan favorite character. So I'm curious, like what kind of level of connection or like how much directive that they give you in terms of how to how to start the story for this particular character, given the world that they're building out? Um, we just talked a little bit about we had like a we had a. A, a little mini writers conference with the writers of the the new books and Joshua and the Skybound team um, because you know they have all the information from Hasbro about what Hasbro is sort of looking for and what they're willing to do and not do so we had that sort of writers room mini writers room that was to help bring us on board and show us all the options and get us started on ideas and I had already started thinking about an idea for using Jinx with Scarlet and maybe the Arashikaji and that seemed very in line with what they were doing and so when we finished that I started putting the pitch together um, the first version of the pitch was sort of a more aggressive version of what we've got now where Shayna was actually adopted by Jinx's family and so was raised as her sister and so they were more literally sisters uh, but we ended up feeling like that was too much change to the Scarlet character, and so we paired it back to them just being friends and sort of like sisters, um, which disrupted Shayna's origin that people may or may not be attached to less, I think. Um, and that's probably, I like the other a little better. I wouldn't have pitched it that way if I didn't, but I think this is probably a fair compromise, you know, to, to serve the most readers the best, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, so I was super excited that it was Scarlet and that she was getting her own sort of, you know, look at her before she's even a Joe, like before that's even happening in her life. I thought it's an incredible gift to get to tell that story and really show her off and make everyone fall in love with her. (laughs) (laughs) What is it like working with Marco? He's fantastic. He has a real um he he has a real like intensity in his work and like a sort of loose quality that I really like that is maybe a bit more European uh than than we see in a lot of sort of mainstream superhero type comics like this. Um but I really that ended up really exciting me because, you know, when I first started figuring it out I feel like there was a lot more sort of Bond and Mission Impossible and like even Black Widow from my run like in that DNA of that because there are just these things that are in the Venn diagram that cross over right so it just makes sense but 
I do think that Marco's work pushed it in like a more slightly chaotic but controlled chaos, like a more frenetic way that it started feeling a little more John Wick, which is appropriate Mm. because of the story. It's not a revenge story, but it's very personal in that same way. And so I think that some of the things he was doing ended up influencing the direction we took it in a great way that makes it more different from something like Black Widow that I did. So I think that's great. Speaking of Black Widow, it reminds me uh, when I was reading Black Cloak, um, you had one moment um, where I think it was one page and you had the characters walking throughout the page. And I felt like that was something you used a lot in Black Widow. So I'm curious at what point you decided to kind of add that aesthetic to Black Cloak or was it more of a, a consciousness on, you know, how many pages you had and you had seen, you know, a lot of dialogue as the, you know, the, the characters were talking, but they have to be moving through a location that you kind of went back to using that style of, of um of choice in your script for lack of a better term (laughs) yeah no it's the deluca effect which thank you is um something i love to deploy i when i when i wrote that page for meredith i don't think i really described it as a deluca effect i think i described it more as a cross-section page where we'd be seeing inside the building as they're moving through it but you're right that it is a deluca because there aren't really panels you know, the actual structure of the building makes up what you're seeing, and there's multiple versions of the figures. Um, I remember being frustrated with that because I didn't relay it completely correctly to Meredith, and so I wanted this sort of thing where they disappear, and then when they reappear, they're still having the same conversation, but I didn't quite execute it correctly, and so it didn't really work. But... um yeah, that page is great. I, I do think I described it more as a cross section than a Deluca effect, but it is. It's funny that I'm writing Deluca effect even when I'm not writing Deluca effect at this point. <laughs> <laughs> is there something that's just about it as a shorthand that you do like to deploy? Like, what is it about it that attracts you as both, you know, someone who reads comics and likes, you know, likes to see the marriage of the art and the story, um, and also as a writer? Is there something about it that really speaks to you? I think. I think there's two things. I think the initial thing, it does speak to me. I just like it as, I mean, I always want people playing a little bit more with form in comics. Like, it's it's an incredible medium. There's a lot of ways to do this stuff. It's why I was so thrilled by something like that Nightwing POV issue. You know, um, yes, more of this stuff. Like, it's not every issue should be about this because if you try to focus more on form, sometimes other things get lost. You know, like, that issue is incredible exercise, but is that the best Nightwing story you've ever read? No. Is it the most interesting or the most innovative? Like, maybe, right? It's, you, you, you maybe can't, if you're, if you're playing with form at that level, Maybe you're not always serving every master, but you're doing this incredible thing and we should watch it and we should try it again and try to do it even better in a different way. So all that sort of stuff really excites me. I think Bruno Redondo is an incredibly exciting artist uh, who I should work with sometime because I think we have a lot of the same ideas about how to break story and like what's interesting about it in comics. Um, But... So the Luca effect, I just think it's a very, you know, we're so, the whole point of comics are these panels, but I do think a lot of the point of the panels gets lost on people because mm. there's, there's some, I mean, I, I think read, media comprehension has become a real problem. I think comics people are better at it than most because comics require more. But I do see a lot of people who are just sort of giving up if they don't feel like every single thing is spelled out for them. And that worries me because there's something – the panel is there for a reason, and it's because something happens between the gutter and the next panel. And it's your brain is supposed to fill that in. And so – it's very fun to then go, well, what if there aren't panels? So what does that look like? And that's what DeLuca effect is like, multiple figures on a page, but then you're not actually getting the panel break. So you get these seamless pages that have these incredible flow or motion or action. It's just a great technique. But the secondary thing is, because I've started doing this, 
across not every single project, but almost every single project, the new delight for me has become seeing the way different artists interpret it. Um, we did a version of one. They weren't all technically DeLuca effect, but we did a version of one of those in every issue of Black Widow. It became part of our signature where these action spreads. And, you know, Elena is so great that <laughs> she never did something twice the same. Uh, all of her spreads were really different despite all playing with the Luca effect. And she really got it because she, you know, she just really got it. Like not only was she playing with the Luca effect, but then she started playing with it within the Luca effect. So some of her pages that seem like the Luca effect because they totally feel that way actually aren't because she's added panels back in. But, like, you almost don't notice it because she's integrated them so well. Like, there's one that's a double-page spread of her, of Black Widow and Yelena, and she used, like, a concentric panels. It's it's incredible stuff. It's so innovative. I love it. Um, and so seeing the way different artists approach it is fascinating to me. And I'm getting so many cool interactions about it. You know, a long time ago, Jan Balduza did it for me on Rogue and Gambit, or I guess it was Mr. and Mrs. X. Mm. Um, and he just did it. So they were like, I broke it down like hallway scenes. And so it was just Gambit and Deadpool fighting through all these Shi'ar uh, in these hallway scenes. And like, that was so fun, but it's completely different than like Leo doing it in Birds of Prey, one of my favorites. You I mean, he did that rooftop one in the first issue, but then in his issue four, I guess, three or four, it's a double page spread with like Harley and Dinah and Sin, and they're fighting all these Amazons in the forest, but then he like layered it, so there's a height to it. It's incredible stuff. So good. So much better than whatever I wrote on that page. <laughs> <laughs> I should be fired and he deserves a raise is all I'm saying <laughs> well I thank you so much for taking the time today I know we're over time so I do it's appreciate okay. it's okay it's okay it's okay all your right. thoughts yeah, um, yeah, it's okay. at some point I'll have you back again I, it, what I will say in general having listened to you know your most recent word balloon and then talking to you now it feels like and I, I apologize for the, how this might sound when we last spoke in September it felt like maybe you were having a harder time with the you know being uh, in the creator own and what that meant and, and the financials and, you know, difficult things in the, in the industry and just kind of being up against it. And it feels like you're in a much better place now. Thank you. Um, I think, I think that's a lot on the Eisner nominations, honestly, because I still had a really hard year. It's, I'm still having a little bit of a hard year. Mm -hmm. Um, but, a lot of us have hard years and you don't always get rewarded with five Eisner nominations. So I'm trying to just be really grateful that that's the way things are going and that, that having a really hard year and doing all that hard work really paid off in a very direct way. Mm -hmm. um, that feels great for these books and all these creators that trusted me and that threw in with me to do them. It feels great. It feels like such a, not redemption because we didn't do anything wrong, but you know, it's just such a, it's such a recognition um, of your hard work. And so many people work hard all the time and don't get that. So I just try to be grateful for it. And um, things are going a little better. I have some big announcements coming. And so while it was a hard year figuring out the image stuff and how, trying to make that play with work for hire and finances have been very frustrating hopefully we're coming out the other side of it. So it did. It, I, what I really enjoyed about the Eisner nominations was the discourse around how you, you know, you won the Eisners, right? Even, <laughs> even if you don't, even if you won none of them, the fact that when you come out of the yeah. nominations and you're tied with Marvel, like that's exciting. Yeah, it was really fun. I it, like the beat talking about my name as if it made it sound like a publisher was <laughs> truly, truly got a delightful giggle out of me that, uh, you know, it was awesome. Uh, knowing me, you know, I suddenly was like, oh, my God, what if we lose all of them? That will be embarrassing. But um, hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> and even if so, it was still an honor to be nominated. So we'll make it. it. I think it's especially fun for a lot of people because 
you did, you know, you, you were someone who worked in the, you know, the comics journalism field before you kind of broke in. Um, so everyone, I think you feel like, you know, you're every, everyone's pulling for you in that way because it feels like you're one of us, you know, you're one of these people who, you know, you've loved comics, you wrote about comics, uh, but you wanted to write comics and now you're just doing such a great job at it that I think everyone gets extra satisfaction in seeing you succeed for that reason. I mean, I hope you're right. I'd love to think that's that, that it's part of it. I, I will say that one of the things that makes me feel really proud about looking at those nominations, leaving the writer one aside, because that's always going to be whatever, is that The Call, Birds of Prey, Black Cloak, and It's Jeff are all wildly different books. Mm-hmm. They look different. They're for different audiences, sort of. Uh, they're... They're about different things, although there are thematic overlaps, as always. They're just wildly different art styles in every one. Like, Mattia's art in the cull is borderline photorealistic. It's so gorgeous. Meredith does, like, a crazy thing that I think people mistakenly say is anime or, like, manga stuff, but Mm. inspired. And it is inspired by manga, but it's so much more than just that. And the colors are masterful. And then Leo's Leo and Jordy's Birds of Prey is it's just like the best kind of sequential superhero comics can be I think like it's so incredible looking and then uh, and then Jeff just being his weird all ages <laughs> self over in the corner here with like the cutest art you've ever seen like I just love that they're so different I I worry you know you often worry about are you pigeonholing yourself or are you being pigeonholed by working on certain books or something or just even organically I look at someone like James Tinian whose work I love who is I mean is he the most successful is he the biggest success story in comics in the last decade like Mm. he's incredible and I don't mean he's successful and it's not warranted I mean both I mean it's warranted and he's the most (laughs) successful it's incredible but I think we would all agree uh, that guy's sweet spot is horror. I mean, he has cornered it, right? And and in a million variations, like none of his horror books feel the same. But I mm-hmm. think we would all agree that they're pretty horror. They they're pretty horror genre centered. And so sometimes you look at someone who's killing it like that, and you go, shit. Should I be doing one thing? Like, should I be telling everyone I'm the best at this one thing? Or um, should I be diversifying? So it was nice to know I hadn't completely destroyed my career by doing, you know, <laughs> four, four books in a year that are all completely different and do not sort of speak to each other. So I don't know. Sounds, so, it sounds like the answer is that it's far from it. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. That's what we're going to choose to believe, at least. Absolutely. <laughs> well, again, Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, loving so all much, your work. Adam. Excited to see Black Cloak come back, even though it's going to be a little longer now. Uh, excited for more It's Jeff later this year. So a lot of good stuff. <laughs> there will be some really fun it, uh, Black Cloak stuff over the summer leading up to that August launch on the, on the newsletter, on the Substack. Um, Meredith sent all these great character designs and we're going to do another character creation contest thing where you can play this game and win a, win a character that gets designed into the, into the book. So we're having a good time. That's awesome. Well, it's very exciting. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Adam.